Welcome to the Upside Down Health Podcast. Today is episode number 12. Graham Tuttle is our guest, and I am uh, very excited about this one. For those of you who don't know Graham, I want to give you a little short introduction, maybe like a little description for you of how I see him. Um, where do I start? Graham is, uh, he's very, he's a very witty guy. So, you know, some say that's a sign of intelligence. Some say it's a sign of arrogance. I guess you guys will have to be the judge of that. Um, you know, most likely I think you'll pick up the vibe that he's, he's a pretty intelligent dude and he's got a lot of knowledge on a lot of topics. Um, if you're watching the video, you can probably tell that he's, uh, he's a good looking dude. He's, uh, He's also obsessed with feet, you know, nothing weird or anything. He just, he just really likes feet. He likes to talk about feet. He, he doesn't really wear shoes very often and, uh, he eats a lot of organ meats. What else is there? Kids love him on TikTok. Um, he's a gym owner. And last thing, if you walk into his gym and you breathe through your nose or not your nose, you breathe through your mouth. Um, you're probably not going to make it out of there. So without further ado, Graham, thanks for being here. I, uh, I feel honored to have not only to be here, but to be described as my prior primary characteristics of being someone that eats organs, doesn't wear shoes. <laughs> I, I think it's like, there's certain descriptor descriptive factors about, about the things that I do, but it's like, I guess, you know, in this day and age when you're, uh, digitizing yourself when you're being demonstrated in terms of like handful of uh notable characteristics then yeah i guess i, I have my thing so animal organs mouth or nose breathing and uh feet and yeah, there you go that's, that's that's what it is the world likes to put people into boxes so I feel like online yeah it is that's that's what it is it's just a combination of and i tell everybody not everybody but like people who want my unsolicited advice is that like when you're when you're a coach there's the person that's in that you in person, that's a very, that's a problem solver. Like you're adaptable, you're flexible, you you can think and apply different skills to solve something. But when you go into the online marketplace and you try something different, like that's that's the internet wants to meme you. It wants to put you into a little box and say, This is who you are, this is what I think I need from you. So you'll notice some of the people who are the most successful they have they categorize themselves, they they put themselves into little boxes about like when I'm like you know, uh, someone we have in common, Ben Patrick, he's the knees of a toes guy, you know, he's not, he's, you know, like, that's the, how clear could it be? It's like, yeah, this is who he is. So when they're like, oh, you know, how do you describe him? Oh, he's this. It's like, but in reality, there's everyone is so much more nuanced and, and broad, but it is an interesting way that we're bifurcating individuals based off of what we need them to be simplified as online versus what they actually are in person. Interesting things. My hope is that you will elaborate on the description that I gave and you will be able to show people that you're more than just the foot guy and the, and the organ and good guy. looks and um, more than just good looks and beautiful feet. <laughs> so the, I've read some questions by you. This one is one I'm really starting to love how people respond to. So you've just received the news that you're going to die today. Nothing to show for your existence, except a one minute audio message to serve as your footprint on the planet what do you say to people? This is such an interesting thing because my my first gut reaction about hearing this question is always, well, you know, at, at this point of cresting the first third of my life, I would hope that I'm just getting to start to figure out what that would be. But at this point, there are a few guiding uh, heuristics that I've found to be beneficial is in the sense is that, you know, people are always doing the best with what they have. Like there's this kind of like people are doing the best with what they have. Like if someone knew better, they would do better, but it's, there's no one has ever done something they thought was actually a bad idea. They're like, people are just always doing things they think is a good idea. And they're always doing things with their self interest in mind. And they're always doing the best that they can. So that gives, I think that that phrase takes away the opportunity for you to uh, complain and to be critical of other people, because you can love them and understand that, we're all scared little kids and we're all just trying to figure out how to make our own world and this uh, this plague, you know, this big sandbox we call earth. But ultimately it's, uh, you know, having compassion and uh, realizing that, you know, the only thing we have is this moment, this now, this present space is really all 
we can ever hope for. It's not a, it's not a, you know, an imagined future or a poorly remembered past. It's just this moment. So, you know, that, that would be what I would assume I'll continue to refine and, and be better to help remind other people. But it's this idea of just what his presence looked like. And yeah, there's the last five seconds would be take your shoes off, breathe through your nose <laughs> and eat real food. <laughs> I love that. Does the idea that you were hinting at at the beginning of like that, you're not going to really know what your whole life is meant for or the meaning of your life until is it go along with like the whole Victor Frankl's man search for meaning like we live our whole lives and at the end you're going to finally kind of figure it all out like you have to see the whole movie yeah so it's tough because you know, to, to draw from a religious context with this, there's the idea of like the good, the true, like I, I'm of the belief that nothing humans can ever do intentionally is ever selfless. Like anything humans ever do is selfish in or in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in nature. And people have a negative connotation of selfish. They think of selfish as like being bad. Maybe self-interested is the better, more, or is it less baggage laden connotation of the word or the concept. But this idea that everything you've ever done has some benefit for you, the way you want to feel, the way you want to be perceived, what you want to receive from that. Like everything you ever do is with that, uh, let's say that uh, the justification, that original context in mind. So, you know, you look at this as like, I think that the Viktor Frankl idea of looking back at your life would require a certain objectivity that I don't think is possible for humans. What I would say is, and let's say most humans, because there is an enlightenment space, you like continue to grow and expand your, your cognitive place, cognitive space. But, you know, I would say that to, to draw from, there's a, a Bible, uh, let's say verse context, uh, d- 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 discusses this idea of, you know, when uh, Jesus is talking on the, uh, the idea that like the, in the end there'll be gnashing of teeth and those who thought they did all this good stuff and people said, Lord, Lord, you know, we fed you, we clothed you, did all this stuff. But he's like, no, you, you know, like basically he's like, you didn't do anything for me. And the other side would be, we didn't know you did any of this stuff. He's like, yeah, but you fed me. So the point of being, and I think you can, whether or not you find yourself to be religious or faithful or spiritual, there's a, a perspective of that, which is that anything that flows through, anything good that happens in your life is, uh, flows through you. So that's another way of, I think it's um, Paul Council talks about this idea of uh, the good that happens is this 90 degree. It's uh, this whatever you're going at 90 degrees from that is where the benefits happening. There's a word for it. Um, you will have to, uh, I, it escapes my head. I think it's a Buckminster Fuller idea where like 90, 90 degrees. So like if I'm moving forward and trying to learn about nutrition and health, um, let's say I've got horrible skin acting. I'm trying to fix that my efforts to move forward and solve my own problem benefits people 90 degrees. So like anyone that's interacting with me, like let's say there's a context, whatever it is, like let's say I am whatever I'm doing this podcast because I like you and I want to support what you're doing, or I want to increase my fame and notoriety and just continue to let people see my beauty. The people that are getting the benefit of that selfish pursuit are 90 degrees relative to that. So they're not necessarily, I'm not thinking about them, but they're getting the benefit from that. So there's a word for it. I can't remember, but the context remains the same of as you're going through this, this life we live to be able to see, you know, we, we think in narrative. We have this idea that we think about what's the story. Am I the main character? Or is this bad thing happening? When's the good thing happening? When's the romance novel going to start? And we think about this in narrative, like where we have figured this out, but most people don't have enough objectivity until we look backwards. We think retroactively and think we, Oh, this makes sense. And I can see how these pieces go together. And there's a part of this where people, you know, someone was saying this idea, like when I, I, I did this and I met this person and how I got to where I was, my job, my security, my opportunity, it feels very lucky. Like, and and I, I had this idea, like every person that would ever say anything is going to feel that it will always feel lucky. You happen to meet the right person at the right time. You, you know, someone had their car broken, you pick them up on the side of the road, it turned out to be a CEO and give you a job. It's like, it will always feel lucky, but we can't see that. It will feel lucky because we looked in the past, but it just, it, it happened the way it would and it would have always happened that way. So mm-hmm. the point of all that saying, I don't think we have the objective ability to think in narrative while we're doing it and potentially look back, but I think that would be a short circuit. Like if I can understand the good of what I brought into the world when I die, 
I probably wouldn't have, I would have undersold my potential, so to speak. And so that's the goal is like, just keep moving forward with things that I find interesting and strike my curiosity and, you know, be present and fully pursue those. There'll be a benefit. If I live a life that I'm happy with, then other people benefit. If I live a life that I'm not happy with, then I'm selling the world short. That's how I'd look at it. Hmm. Yeah, I know. I think it makes a lot of sense to me. I'm curious how you like, how would you define, um, like you mentioned the word luck. So how do, what do you think about luck in the universe? Like, is that, uh, is that a law or is that kind of like, is there no luck? We just kind of, things just kind of happen. Well, uh, that would imply that I have knowledge that I do not, but, uh, as, as coach speak <laughs> would say, luck is when opportunity meets preparation. You know, it's like, was it lucky that you hit the three pointer at the buzzer? Maybe, but it also like helped that you spent you know, 20,000 hours shooting free throws forever. It's like, so the point is, uh, there's this idea of like thinking and emoting, like once you create the emotion, emotional energy, that idea is now in existence and therefore it has to, you know, energy can either be created or destroyed. It's just like, you've created this thing and now it has to come through fruition. That's an idea that Paul Council talks about this idea that like emoting something into existence you know, whether you call that luck, I think luck is a colloquial term that people, people understand the connotation of, but I don't necessarily know if it's beneficial to think about this. There's a, there's a certain randomness. There's a certain lack of control that we, we assign when we think of luck that I don't, I think sells it short because in many ways, I, I, I've, I've, I've started to play with this idea that like, if life is a simulation and there are no rules and you just make it up, then like, what would you emote into existence, you know? And the thing is that people are have no inability to think about, oh, I would like to have a yacht and I want to have a car and do this stuff. It's like, okay, go emote into existence, but realize that there are, it's not about what benefits you want, it's about what problems you want to have. Like, do you want a girlfriend? Well, you know, do you want the problems that a girlfriend brings? You know, do you want a, a par- problems that a partner does, like kids do, or a new car, or a job, or that, like, I want to be famous on social media. Okay, do you want the problems? And that's what I'm playing around with now is that, like, being famous on social media means you're constantly having to make new content, make, you know, stay the flavor of the week and allow get people to continue to look at you because it's a busy marketplace and you got six to eight hours of DMs and content every single day and it never stops. And people are always, you know, going to ask for more stuff. And it's like, do you really want that? You know, do you want to be the next president and be the person that's ridiculed and hated by everybody in the world? So like, <laughs> it's one of those, like luck is this idea of, I get what you're really asking is, do we have any, form of autonomy and capacity to form the life we exist Mm -hmm. someone like sam harris would say no that everything's already we are the result of certain things already in place and that you know it is what it is i find it to be i would say that the majority of humans i think free will exists in rare circumstances i think humans are the only which is uh, another thing is you know this is a different question we discussed but like humans are my favorite animal because they are the only animal that has a capacity for free will because, mm. and, and this is not all humans, by the way, but the only time I think we are capable of free will is when we objectively, we pause and we think about a future, we create and emote a future in. And so when, you know, if you walk in and someone says something that triggers you, guess what? That's you respond. The second your heart rate gets up and you go to your lizard brain, that like deeper, deep brain stem, you're just a fight or flight, you know, yeah, am I, I going to mate with you? Or am I going to kill you? That's not free will. That's you responding. But there are moments with practice, with preparation, you call it luck, where you can step out of that moment. You can, and as Victor Frank would say, you know, the only freedom you can take away from a man is the ability to choose his reaction, his thoughts. That moment between response, action, or impetus and action, you have the ability to choose. It's the only form of free will. Is that takes power, practice, and and let's say repetition and get to that space. But when you can pause and think, what do I want here? When you journal and you create that future, you create that opportunity. That's the only time you have free will. And I think that's when you, you, we do have an incredible power for that. Maybe we don't, maybe it's all a lie. Maybe it's a simulation and everything's cast, but I find it to be much more empowering to believe that that's an option because then it motivates me to get up and say, it feels right to me, which is only a benefit in so much, but you know, it, it motivates me to go and be my best and to continue to grow because, you know, having a stake in the company makes you work hard. So that makes sense. It's, so it sounds like you're saying that humans, the average human is kind of like this mechanical, 
process that's just like running on what it's been programmed to do or what it's learned from people and then it kind of takes this like level of awareness to interrupt the patterns to like kind of choose your own destiny yeah that's, and that's again i hate to say the word average i would say everyone i would like to think that everyone has a capacity for free thought and independent will but i think it's a skill of thinking and as paul counts would say most people don't think they thunk which is they look backwards and try to like you know they're just reacting to the world and so you know like just this idea like to to go against the grain, to question what is and say, is this me or is this a learned capacity, a learned habit that I've picked up from someone else? You know, like that's, a, I think that's a rare thing because it, it requires difficulty. It requires the only, I, I would say this humans, the only time we have free will is when we move into discomfort. So we actively, because our brain will always take us away from discomfort. If we let the reaction of anything is to take us away from discomfort. I touched the hot stove, I pull away. Someone yelled at me, I hit them. I, you know, someone scared me, I run away. Like that is our, our lizard brain, the deep part that is trying to keep us safe, always moves away from discomfort. The conscious brain is one that moves towards discomfort. And so that's where someone decides, I'm going to go work out and train. Like I'm going away from the comfort. I'm actively, and this is why it's so powerful when I think we see people that are able to discipline themselves, take ownership and autonomy of their body is they're able to say, you know, I'm going to move into a space where I'm uncomfortable. And, you know, that is a rare thing that most people don't because they don't, ever, they don't even think that's a possibility. They just have a, a gut reaction to go away from something. Um, you know, and sometimes we can have incentives that get us to go there and like happen to do this. And you find that it's like, you, you enjoy the way it goes after. But so I would say this, there's a certain point, like for me, Working out, there's a part of this a discomfort, but a part of me knows that like I would feel more discomfort if I didn't work out and exercise. So there's a part of it that like it's not so much that every time I go work out is an act of free will, but I would say the first few times where anything that's a fear, like you move into discomfort and the, the fear of like I'm going to move towards something that I want to go away from, that's intentional choice. And I don't think animals have the capacity to do that other than humans. I think our brains give us that ability to receive we are antennas for ideas that we can receive thought forms and energy and then move in that so that's what i would say so we are your favorite animals but you think we are more evolved than other animals and we have a higher capacity but could i guess differently could, uh, could other animals like could they eventually develop that kind of capacity or are we just like a different um i would say i mean, fuck do i know but uh you know <laughs> that's one part but i would say that there's a certain level of um, I, I, there are different levels of consciousness. So other animals are conscious. It's a difference between conscience and consciousness and free will and autonomy. Um, you know, like you look at the capacity to play, for example, like play is an evolutionary thing where animals can play because, you know, let's say they've learned that because the two bears that are wrestling, two cubs or two dogs that are playing. It's like, it's a very valuable thing. So they have the capacity to play. So not every animal is just always running around looking for food, but there are certain things that are evolutionarily geared into us to try and get us to say, all right, you know, what does it help? What does a healthy development look like? That's, that's one part of it. Um, but in context, so you got to look at what humans have sacrificed to develop the brain we have. Uh, there's a good argument to be made at the stone age theory that we, evolved part and parcel with psychedelic mushrooms and the 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 valley of the Nile River where you know there was a lot of the ancestors to the bovine cows that we eat mostly now were there and there was cow dung and they would have had a fertile plain in the middle of where the Nile you know valley was uh, uh, I'd say the Sahara Desert I think uh, whatever that desert in the north of Africa is mm -hmm. that that was um, instrumental in allowing our brain to expand so rapidly but you know, realize like we're pretty physically unremarkable. We can't, you know, we're, we don't have fur. We can't stay warm. We can't run fast and fast relative to other animals. We can't fight. We're pretty weak. We've given up a lot of stuff to get this brain. And I would say that humans are continuing to evolve, but I think most of the evolution happens in the marketplace of ideas now. So you look at what human evolution looks like physically, not so much. We're getting weaker. We're getting you know smaller. We're getting less strong. We're getting less capable, but you know, our brains are involving a capacity and not always in a beneficial thing. Most kids, while they may have a capacity to hold on to more ideas and serial switch better, a lot of kids are getting dumber because all they look at is just, they don't have the ability to be alone or to, uh, let's say, self-soothe because they're always being entertained. So there are great, like Thomas Aquinas, um, 
Victor Frankl, there are great minds throughout like Socrates that you could argue that they're smarter than any of us are now, but our capacity to bridge that with a higher level, like some people are, I still think it's like a 1% or a 0.1% that are really making the world move. Um, you know, so other animals could, but you know, would, would evolution select for that? Evolution already selected for us to have this capacity and, you know, are the, the changes and the sacrifices other animals have, it's like, you know, let's say humans wipe everybody, wipe us all out with nukes. And then, you know, in 10 million years, another animal continues to develop and evolution continues to select. And there's another animal that looks weird. Like, you know, what would be different about an, a dolphin with our brain capacity? Well, they don't have opposable thumbs. So it's like, you know, there's some like, it, it's, it's just interesting. So mm-hmm. I, I think I would say that it's less likely. Yeah. Yeah. The dolphin thing is interesting to me too, because I didn't, I never thought about the opposable thumbs though, but like, yeah, I guess that makes sense that the big thing, like you're saying is that we're not physically like we don't stand out, but like we're clearly running the world. So there must be something that's going on that's different about us, but you bring up the psychedelic mushroom theory and I don't really know that much about that, but I've also heard people talk about how, well, and you mentioned it too with the cows. So like, this is a big argument for why to eat meat, basically that eating animals helped our brains expand and this is who we are. So like by avoiding that, you're kind of going against yourself. You've, you were the one that got me on animal-based nutrition. Um, when I was at a dark point in my life, you reached out, you said, I got this program for you, check it out. And I applied what you said and it like, it's turned my whole life around. Like I, I'm spreading the message because I believe in this stuff. So can you share a little bit about your journey with finding animal-based nutrition? Why, what's going on with these organ meats? Um, how is this like affecting how you view things in the world? So it's a really good question and is broad, but I would say that for me, the, I always like to think about things in terms of like, what's the simplest answer with the least amount of assumptions and there there's this idea that you know humans don't need animals to eat we don't need a lot of protein but you think about like what would humans have existed on forever right and so most people they would have well the first thing they would have eaten based off of what food was available to them right and only in very certain parts of the world are plants available year round and by plants i mean fruit and in those places it's very tropical places with fish and so you know, the, you think of people that are closer to the equator have darker skin. They're more used to getting vitamin D. They don't need as much vitamin D because they're getting it from the sun. They don't need as much of it from the sun or from their food. So they're getting lighter, fleshier fish. Um, they're eating uh, a lot more fruit, a lot of vitamin C. As you get north, people get a little bit lighter and then they start to have more fat in their diet. So they get fattier fish in the colder areas, fattier animals, uh, starchier foods. So like you start to see the context of things changing, but one thing is for sure is that whether it's fish, whether it's uh, like land animals or whether it's birds, people would have never been able to live just off of vegetables alone. Up until today, we have the modern convenience of mass transportation and um, mass transportation to bring food around the world, it, you know, conveniently perfectly shaped options and, you know, stock the, the fridge and, and the, uh, the, the produce place. So that was the idea of like, okay, so maybe the story of eating animals isn't as, you know, cut and dry as you would hear from people that are saying, oh, well, you, you know, it's not good to eat animals that's bad for you and all this stuff. So once you start questioning that, you start to kind of back up into, hey, flip it, stop it. You start to back up and say, okay, well, why do they think that? And you realize that most of the, like veganism is not an argument from health. It's an argument for a moral philosophy about how they see the world and in it, which is fine if you want to do that, but you don't have to make the argument. So all vegetarian veganism is an argument from a philosophical perspective that then tries to espouse that in animal rights, sustainability, or health. It's not true though, because you look at the longevity and health of people that eat, and it's not everybody, but without supplements, without, um, the capacity to do this, you're not going to get people that can thrive on a vegan diet and vegetarian can work. But again, you got to realize that like, just because it can work today, doesn't mean it's ancestrally consistent with what we would have had access to and what we would have eaten. So 
like that's that's the big uh, primary frame. So once I made that jump and saying, okay, well maybe you know I don't need to be eating as many of these vegetables and all this stuff, you start to realize like, well, why do you eat vegetables? The point of eating vegetables is supposed to get vitamins and minerals, right? You need fiber, you need vitamins and minerals. But then you look and say, well, that's like saying I need to work out because I need to exercise. But well, I don't just need exercise blanketly, I, a blanket statement exercise. I need something to stress my muscles. I need to work on my range of motion. I need to strengthen my knees, et cetera. So it's like, well, let me find the best options to do that. So instead of just saying, I'm going to go and do a bunch of squats because it's good for my knees, I'm going to say, well, there's actually better ways to do that, which is a big thing from ATG, like working with Ben Patrick is like, there's better ways to train your knees than just doing, you know, let's say squats and kettlebell swings. Now that they can't work, but if you're trying to optimize things and you want to say, well, when it comes to nutrition, what's the best, most nutrient dense food option I can find? And you come to find that there's plant versions of these minerals and vitamins and there's animal versions and not all things that the humans need are available in the plant. And so you can supplement and do some of that stuff, but you know, the reality is saying that we have a, our capacity to absorb nutrition and vitamins is much higher when it comes from an animal based source. That brings me to the point of a lot of people would say they do the, the carnivore thing where they just eat a bunch of steak and maybe some eggs. And they're like, I got everything I need. It's like, well, you know, the animals, there's a good Chinese philosophy perspective that says, if you want strong muscles, you eat muscles. If you want strong connective tissue and bones, you eat connective tissue and bones. And if you want strong organs, eat the organs. And so truly eating animal based means you're appreciating the fact that a life had to die for you to have this nutrition and that you would never waste it. You would never waste things like the cartilage or connective tissue, the bone marrow, the organs, the liver, kidney, heart, spleen, tongue, you know, thymus, uh, et cetera. And you never waste the muscle, but we only almost always just eat the muscle. And we, you know, it, it's just like, we waste a lot of this. We have sick animals. So the hard part is saying that animal-based nutrition is playing some of the most effective way to get the nutrient density you need for a thriving body. doesn't mean it's the only way. It doesn't mean you can't be plant-based and it doesn't mean that it's can't be done poorly, but in terms of optimization, it's cut and dry the best option out there. That doesn't mean that the quality of the animals don't matter. If you're raising sick animals and they're in horrible conditions, that's going to contribute negatively to the sustainability of, of how scalable it is, uh, certain negative aspects for the environment, negative aspects for the food, the quality you eat, the quality of the food you eat, the nutrition you're getting. So like a lot of this has gotten from, you know, let's say there's, and it's not even just a, um, let's say a money thing, but it's, well, I guess it is, but it's these large conglomerate companies that try and weed out local farmers and their ability to get to slaughterhouses and, and make this a much more scalable, sustainable thing you know, it's people are fighting against one another. But ultimately, if you're looking for the most nutrient dense, optimal way to eat for most people it's going to involve some combination of fish, animals, and fruit. And that's what animal based is it doesn't have to be any more dogmatic than that. What is it about vegetables that might be like, somewhat dangerous? Because, you know, to me, I was told my whole life, eat your veggies, eat your veggies, eat your veggies, right? So what what kind of like science, what kind of like philosophies are there out there about why maybe veggies aren't as healthy for us as we may think? Uh, you know, I'd say this in a sense of like, there's a certain component of the carnivore thing where veggies might not be good. The simple example is like, if you have a dog or a cat, there's, there's certain house plants you can't let them eat because it's poisonous for them. Well, those plants are poisonous for you too as well, or for you as well, but you just know not to eat them. So if you were to walk out and just eat any old plant in the forest or the woods next to your house, if you eat enough of it, it would make you sick. And that's because these plants can't run away and therefore they have defense molecules built in. That being said, when we look at the fruit and really the vegetables, in a any given store, food store, there's really only about 12 families of those vegetables that are there. So like we've, we've over generations, we picked the least toxic, we've, gener we've modified them, we've farmed them and we've made them bigger and more sustainable, like more um, nutrient dense, so to speak. Um, you know, which again is if you are careful the D, the lower quality of the soil because we only do monocrop agriculture and the, the, they're not really that nutritious to begin with. Like you can, the argument would be that certain plant defense chemicals can build up and create problems in the body. And that's certainly true. Like if you have thyroid, certainly isocyanates, um, 
that prevent the uptake of iodine can negatively affect your thyroid. But there's a bit of that, I think gets a little bit too much into like a fear mongering and a religious side of things. Cause people get very, you know, with, without, without God, they get very religious about their food. And <laughs> there are people in the carnivore category that get just as religious as vegans. And so like, well, I can't eat it. It makes me sick. It's like the point of being a healthy human is to have an adaptable nutrient absorption system. Meaning I can eat, this and I'm be fine. I can eat that. And I'm, I'm, we're adaptable, but that doesn't, you know, so there's, it doesn't have to be an extreme of like, these things are unhealthy and bad for me. You can just say, make the argument of like, I prefer to get real nutrients and real food. If you're eating vegetables, it's fallback food. It's what people would eat when they didn't have meat available. They didn't have organs. And so, you know, some people might be more sensitive. So certain things like wheat and grains are there, but you know, the argument is like, ideally you want to be able to do well on all foods and, maintain that do you need a bunch of fiber no i mean that's the thing is like fiber does not stop constipation actually can increase make constipation worse actually the only thing it does is make bigger bowel movements and your body has the capacity to get fuel for the the gut associated lymphatic tissue and the uh let's say the microbiome so the tissue the uh, cells and the bacteria in your gut that help absorb things through the breakdown of protein and ketones for fats so like this there's a um, isobutyrate you forget the name I, I'm, I'm a little rusty on this stuff um but there's you know the ketones can be broken down so the point is that the body has multiple ways of getting this fuel and it doesn't have to be an all or nothing but the problem is as you see this very religious place where they want to go sustainability and there's a whole a paradigm around like what's sustainable and it's bad for the environment and we need you to eat vegetables and we need you to not kill life really a lot of this has to do with like the religious uh, ethos behind a very vegan and animal based it's it's an anti-human flourishing approach we don't want people to live and you know they you'll see this in the the main the people that have the power they want to try and keep everyone else down so speak to so these large european councils they get around and talk about climate change they want everyone to live like the a average you know poor to average european person and you know, they, you shouldn't have two cars, you should have an, a big house, you shouldn't, you know, waste, you know, pollution is bad. It's like, and of course, of course, being intentional about how we live is important, right? Not wasting things is important. But there is a certain level of like, all right, we just want to feel important. So we're going to cut off cheap energy while there's still 4 billion people that are starving in the world. It's like, and don't have light and energy. So you start to see these things kind of roll together. And there's this, this incessant like compulsion that people want to control someone else they don't eat meat it's bad you're a bad person it's harming the environment it's harming your body and really it's not i mean it's like this is the most nutrient food this is how humans have lived for millions of years ago and you know so like okay there's something else and the best solution these people have is like okay it, it, they're just you you without sounding too conspiratorial there's a certain level where it's a control thing and they're trying to dictate the way you can live and you know, you can go down any number of thought patterns, but the simple thing is there's no money in healthy people and dead people. So they need you to be sick. So how do they sell things that said to healthy people is they make them feel like, oh, well, maybe you need supplements. Maybe you need to do this. Maybe optimize your nutrition with supplements, with products, with, you know, pre-workouts. And, and so I can enjoy pre-workout, but, you know, they want you to work on longevity and get your telomeres fixed and get your, you know, get your red, your skin redone and all this your Botox. They want, they have to make healthy people believe that they're not healthy and then they, or they make them sick. So they make people mentally sick by teaching them that they're not okay, or they make people sick. And that's where you look and say, you know, you, if you really want to go down the, the what sounds like a conspiracy, but it's really just incentives. It's like, there's a reason that we don't sell like the actual solution to get people healthy is eat well, sleep well, get sunlight, breathe, you, you know, and it's like an exercise. It's like that's the sixth part, like the sleep, light, uh, breath, food, water, movement. Those are the six things. It's free. You can go and do that stuff. I and mean, obviously food costs money, but like it's plentiful. It's available, but they don't talk about that. They want to sell you a new shot, a new pill, a new procedure. And it's like, so then, of course, you know, you get people that want to encourage this. We're going to, a company could sell you cereal and grains and this manufactured thing. It's like they, but you, once you get these large farmers that want to, like, even, even when you get some of the meat, like this big meat, so to speak, where you get these large companies that can yeah, accumulate and buy all these small operations out and then turn it into like a commodity. It's like they're trying to sell you something. And then, of course, the quality goes down. So the best things in life are free to many, in an extent, so to speak. Um, or things that are sustainable and required for life for free, but that doesn't make people money. So 
it's in their best interest to prove to you that you need their thing. So you can go down the line, but like pe- feeding people fake food that makes them feel like they're full, but then doesn't have any nutrients and then giving them supplements causes them to be fat, sick, and ill. And guess what? We sell them different products. And it's like, that's how the thing goes. It's just once you realize and pull back, you start eating an animal-based food with nutrient-dense, high quality, and then you feel better, you start moving. And you can do that with a ve- nutrition, vegetable, or plant-based thing now too, but it's really hard to do without nutrients. And I have not yet seen, and this is just, just a, my own a prerogative and a, a, my own uh, perspective and opinion, but I've not yet seen someone that I envy the way they look in real life, that's plant-based. It just has never happened. So, um, but you know, again, that's, those are my opinions and, uh, neither fact nor true. Well, you, yeah, you clearly have a lot of knowledge here and it's, there's so much to think about there, but the whole idea you're getting at is just that like, you know, maybe there's, uh, some other things going on and then everything you've been told isn't necessarily true. And the more you question things, the more things are revealed and you you just kind of got to experiment with these things on your own and not just take the advice that people are giving you. Yeah. And, And a caveat to that with the nutrition is like, I want people to hear the difference of like, I'm not saying you can't be plant based and I'm not saying you can't thrive or do well in that. The argument, and this is not an argument, it's just the perspective is like, if you look at the way the human body and the human digestive system is wired and oriented, it clearly does well with nutrients. Like it's, it's like vitamin A, so the retinol is, you get vitamin A is in the plant form is called a carotenoid, to create, you know, we get carotenoids. And then vitamin A in the animal form is retinol, or retinolic acid. So you can get a, you can get the plant form and then your body can convert it, but it's generally a 10 to 30% for all these, you get vitamin A, vitamin uh, B, there's several that are only available in plant form, unless you get like algae and certain things that this like, whatever, like the point I look at it and say like, what, what's the point of having rules? Like who decided you need to have rules? And that's when I get off the, the bus from people that start to make rules about what you eat. It's like, I don't eat animals. I don't eat plants. I don't need, you know, it's like, what just eat real food it's like animals and plants are both real food some may be better than others some you might like better than others but it's like depending on your skin color and where you came from and what you your ancestors looked like they might tell you something about what you'd be best served to eat but you know it's like when people get rules about this stuff it's like you just that's the opposite way i want to go so you know people hear this and be like oh well who said you can't do this it's like i don't i'm not arguing for one or the other i'm just saying from an evolutionary perspective you can't argue the fact that Eating only plants is an opportunity afforded by, for 98% of the world is you know, where people, location there was only afforded by modern technology. And so I was like, we did it, we've survived, we did okay. So, you know, like there's no reason to make a rule about not eating one or the other. It just seems silly to me and juvenile. Yeah. Yeah. It does seem dogmatic either way. It doesn't sell online though. <laughs> no, that's the thing. Like the carnivore code is obviously going to sell more than like eat animals or like, which you see, Paul, the guy who wrote the Carnivore Code, he's now moved more, and he's never like, well, he definitely is more of an odd dogmatic guy, but he's moved more towards an animal based diet. Like, he is down living in Costa Rica, he's out in the sunlight, so he eats a lot more fruit. It's, you know, and more fish. I don't know if he eats a lot of fish, actually. He's a little bit, he's still in that mindset, but he's liver, he eats animals, and he eats a lot of fruit. And some people would get on, that's not carnivore, it's not keto. It's like, who cares? Like, th- that's the thing is, like, you're going to die anyway. It's like, who cares? <laughs> But I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not trying to make a food my religion, so to speak. No, but it's important to like express your emotions about it and let people know the facts because I feel like a lot of this stuff, like you're saying, it all is related to philosophy and worldview. And if you really do want to, I, I used to feel like that too. Like I would look at animals, I could be like, I could never kill an animal. I, I, I don't even want to eat meat, but. The way that I think the way that changed it for me was reading Saladino and he said, like, you know, everything's living. And like you said, something has to die. Right. And we kind of have this perspective as humans that like plants are somehow not below us. Living. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're different. I had a, I could <laughs> crack me up because I had somebody who was like a vegan. They were talking they were vegetarian or something. They, they made this point of like, well, do you think, oh, I mean, they were, they were plant-based and they wanted to go full vegan, but they were, and I, I don't care, but like, it's your body, your life. But 
they were saying, well, you know, I heard this thing, I saw this thing that like they did an energy, you know, they, they apparently they somehow they scanned the energy around the object. So they saw uh, the apple still alive and had energy, but the animal flesh was dead. I'm like, so what you're telling me is that you're going to eat something that's still alive as opposed to eating something that's dead. And their point was like, oh, isn't it disgusting that you're eating something that's dead? And it's like, as opposed to what killing something that's alive and eating it like this is it is it is like a it's a valuable thing if you're cute and fuzzy i don't want to kill you like i would never eat a dog so he was like i would never eat a dog so i would eat a cow like i need a dog if i was hungry enough but like th this is this cracks me up too because people say that they go well if you would never i got two dogs and look at them and like would you never eat them so why would you eat a cow sound different it's like well like sure i see what you're saying but the point is it's like i'm still using the point is you shouldn't use an animal right you should never even if like because they would not the, the you get to this, the far end of the spectrum and they say well i wouldn't even eat a chicken even if they're laying egg, i wouldn't even eat a chicken egg it's like well you're not harming the chicken it's laying the egg it's just going to go to waste so the point is it's like well we don't want to use animals well, guess what i have these dogs as my slaves they don't leave the house unless they go on my leash they stay, they put them in cage when I go out, I feed them the food. Like they get two square meals, a cot in a cage and I get to go out when I let them on the leash. I'm using them to be cute, so I pet them. It's like, sure, maybe they're alive, but it's like, is that better than what they would be if they're running around and have freedom? It's like, it's like the whole thing with the Tiger King where it's like, well, you can't have this, the Tiger King can't have his tigers because he's showing the people making money. But the, whatever, Carol Burnett, what Carol, uh, some basket, she can have them because she's saving them. It's like, it's just, it's this, it's this like, it's this philosophy. This is um, like, it's just this dogmatic perspective of like, it's okay to use some animals for some things, but not for others. It's like humans are animals. We've existed with animals for millennia, you know, and that's how farming started. The first farming was done with guess what? Horses and mules that plow the ground. And now we have technology. So you know, now we have gas, which is, you know, whenever slavery gets removed as we get cheaper technology for it. So like when people get away from that, so you have gas, which provides the power of, of animals. Like there's a reason called power, call it horsepower, right? How many horses can you power this thing? So, hmm. you know, you think about this perspective of, you know, I would never kill or hurt another animal. It's like, well, yeah, you're just discrediting the fact that you are uh, monocrop, your 10,000 acres of monocrop is, millions of lives with little cute animals, like little, uh, you know, mice and rodents and squirrels and birds and bird nests and insects and all of the plants that are dying or the fact that they're living in this very unnatural place. And it's like, and not to mention the deforestation that goes down and make these large swaths of land and that animals are generally 30% of the ground, 30% of the ground is only 30% of the earth's surface is arable, meaning we can plant, right? And so we have to use that for farmland. 70% of it is not arable, meaning we can put cows and uh, livestock there to grow and actually make it more de-desertified so they grow you know they they pee they dung they walk and trample it down they eat the grass and actually grow a livelihood back into that area so it's a silly idea of saying oh well we shouldn't use animals at all it's like that's the only way we exist in the future is if we keep using animals and you know this idea of like some animals are more valuable than others that's all just games you're playing mentally to try and justify some of these things because you don't you're disgusted by death and the fact that somebody has to die but only when it's not someone that you can see like you're going to have your your phone that's maybe with conflict chemical or conflict uh minerals and people who are in basic slave labor so you can have a cheap phone and you're going to complain about how expensive things are but then you know go buy the cheapest thing it's like it just it ends it bugs me to no end because people don't really they just want to complain and they want a thing to, to talk about as opposed to like actually caring about the benefits and the the things going on behind it not everybody but a lot of people they just it's the flavor of the month for them yeah so slavery is still existing and i, I like the dog example because i thought about that before like when i see two dogs walking down the street and they start barking at each other i'm like what are they doing are they are they trying to escape like they're trying to escape get away run, run. <laughs> i thought wait he got you hooked up too I mean, like, you don't think about it, but there probably are a lot of dogs out there that are like, damn, like, what would it be like to be free? I mean, they don't think that way because they don't have I the doubt. capacity to think of themselves as a, different. But I do mm -hmm. look, it's like, you know, my dogs are both laying in here sleeping. It's like they sleep. People are like, oh, my dog doesn't like to go for walks. He just likes to sleep all the day. No, your dog is depressed because he doesn't go outside. Or people that have, you know, <laughs> I have a dog, but we never walk the dog. It's, they, he's an indoor dog. 
no animals an indoor animal people don't even indoor animals and we basically basically live indoors it's like your dog does not want to just i mean maybe at this point but it's like i mean it it it's just it, it's a loss of perspective on the fact that we are animals and that we are part of the world it's just like it is a disconnect there and it blows my mind i i didn't expect to talk about dogs tonight but like since we're on the topic um it's it's interesting because this is related to diet too like now that dogs hang out with us so much all of a sudden they're getting cancer right so like <laughs> what's going on there well the argument like it's not that animals so there's two things this, you know there's like long-term stress has the same impact on the body and the brain as traumatic brain injury so like long-term chronic stress is there so there's three things there's the, the lack of sunlight fresh air lack of real food so we feed dogs shit food basically the dog food is in the hardware section um we give them plastic toy toys made in china to go chew so go figure that you know we don't give them clean water they you know it's like they hardly get exercise they don't have a purpose and the argument is that like well do animals not die of cancer out in the wild most animals before they would get the chance to die of cancer they get eaten because they got slowed off and old or they you know fell or hunted whatever it is um that doesn't mean other animals can't get cancer so like it's one of those things there's only two way to die there's either you die of immortality which is cancer your cells stop repeating or you die of you know let's say like an acute death where you get killed like if you don't get killed you're going to die of immortality meaning your cancer takes over so the question is is whether or not the cancer incidence we see in these animals is normal and well first off we've taken off the risk they're not going to get eaten most of them are not going to get eaten or shot because they are now a lot of these dogs well they get put down but you know, dogs live. And so they're going to live older than they would have in the wild. And they're also going to be less healthy. I mean, you know, go look at the dog toys you have. How many of them are made in China? Would you put that try? How many of these, you know, think about it, like go find a plastic thing like this, this helmet. Am I going to chew on that? Or like, we don't even microwave things. Well, most people shouldn't be microwaving things in plastic or we're drinking, you drinking out of a metal Yeti. It's like, why not drink out of a, you know, a reheated Wendy's cup? Well, we know that that's so, but how many dog toys are BPA free unless you want to go pay for it? And then, then there's BPS or just some other replacement that hasn't been figured out yet. So you know, there's a lot of things to it, but, you know, let's just say dogs, respiratory problems that come from breeding generations of dogs. And, you know, the most animals die if they breathe through the mouth. Dogs can pant because they don't have sweat glands, but look at respiratory problems. It's like most animals breathe through their nose until they get around humans. And guess what? Breathing goes out the window. So... In terms of mouth breathing, mm. we can move into this the sleep tenet of your six mm. stage philosophy on health. Um, you value your sleep, obviously. You got a lot going on, so some days you you're not getting enough sleep. But what's going on with sleep? What's what's so important about it? And what is this whole tape your mouth at night thing? What, why might I want to consider that? Well, the thing with sleep is it's like, it's one of these ubiquitous things that people know. It's like, oh, go get your sleep. Well, yeah, everyone knows that. But I think it's a, everyone knows it until they really get it. It's like, there's an individual thing. And most people are chronically, they're exhausted in the morning. So they use some type of amphetamine, some type of Adderall, Vivan, some caffeine, some stimulant to get them to wake up. And then they have to, they're amped up because they're stressed all day. They're looking at something, they're breathing through the mouth, they're, you know, overworked. And then by the time they get to the evening, they need a depressant, so like marijuana or alcohol or um, some type of like sleeping aid to help them sleep. And it's like basically you're just turning your brain on and turning it off. But most people have never given themselves two to three weeks of just like, I'm going to really prioritize sleep and just make this a consistent thing. They either don't go to bed, it's not like a consistent schedule, it's not dark enough, it's not quiet enough, it's not cold enough. You know, it's not comfortable enough, you name it, right? So they don't look at that. So they never actually get to a point where they're caught up on sleep. So they have this massive sleep debt and then they're chronically, you see it in their eyes. So just eyes are down, they're dro droopy. And so the reality is that people just don't, people don't have this juxtaposition and say, this is what it would feel like if I wasn't sleepy. They just take it like, oh, I'm just, you know, I only need five hours of sleep. Like, get out of here. Like, those are the things that blow my mind is this disillusion, this, uh, they're, they just don't have any good comparison to say, oh, this is not healthy. And so, you know, when you look at that, there is the taping your mouth is 
partly related to the quality of sleep because one of the things if you're snoring if you're breathing through your mouth the quality of air and oxygen you get is worse and you it, if you breathe uh, it throws off your bicarbonate so it's a i think forgive me if i get this wrong it has to do with your kidney produces bicarbonate which balances out the sodium and potassium and electrolytes in your blood and so when you are breathing you're losing air through the more rapidly through your mouth the respiration and that throws off your bicarbonate levels which makes it seem like you're dehydrated and so you'll wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom because you're filtering out the stuff when you're not really so you're dehydrating yourself you're uh you're losing the electrolytes you need and you wake up and you're thirsty so you wake up you drink water and so anything that wakes you up in the middle of the night is not ideal Plus, the quality of your sleep goes down when you're breathing through your mouth as opposed to your primary respiratory structures, your nose, your diaphragm, and your internal and external intercostals. So, you know, breathe, you don't have to tape your mouth, but it's one of those things where, like, I get people talk, oh, I don't breathe through my mouth when I sleep. Like, how do you know you're asleep? And then they're like, oh, I just don't. I'm like, okay, whatever. Uh, but for me, it's been a big thing of an insurance policy of, like, yeah, I, I just, you're not grinding your teeth as much. Yeah, you know, you're basically you, your teeth don't grind. You're sleeping better. It's a higher quality, and it you know forces you to breathe well correctly. What's the deal with side sleeping? Do you know anything about that? Uh, so theoretically, side sleeping is the most effective way to sleep uh, because it allows the cerebral spinal fluid to drain out of your brain at night when you sleep. So your body at night, your uh, the viscosity of certain fluids in your brain changes so you can clean out so you actually get an inflammation an influx of fluid in your brain it cleans out uh, so this is another big thing of sleep um you get these byproducts of just work throughout the day and it's just like as you go through the week you you get clutter like as you go through a week you can fill up a trash can so at night so at home so you take it out take out your trash at night that's what happens to your brain it's like you kind of clean your brain and polish it back up that's when you process and, and like refine memories and do everything um, and so when you look, when you lay on your side, it allows you the cerebrospinal fluid, it, like, uh, it flows out, like it basically allows better circulation in that. So at least that's the theory. Um, it's probably more than a theory. It's been tested and, and shown to be true, but, but I've always been a side sleeper, but the problem with the side sleeper is that you can easily smash one hog, you know, if you're not careful, your head will get like bent over into a weird position and then your knees will collapse in. So you know, this is something to think about a lot because um, the alternatives, I always think about like, well, how are people have slept for these big cushy, you know, uh, let's say mattresses with uh, perfect knee pillows and a perfect neck pillow. And then like, you know, how would humans have existed before that? And then the other side of that is saying, well, what's the alternative? Well, sleeping on your back it depends on your position. If you sleep on your back that's flat, you can generally, like that's actually a really good way. So when I go to bed at night, I lay there on my back flat with no pillow under my head because I want my, my spine to realign to have that flat area, which is uncomfortable at first, but that shows you're getting that kind of sloped over grandma vulture neck if you're not careful. Um, so I lay like that for a few minutes and just breathe and just kind of center myself as I practice falling asleep until I fall asleep. I pretend to be asleep until I am asleep. And this is a great Seth quote. And it's like, just like, you know, we're all pretending to do it until we're doing it. So like, no matter what you're doing, you want to make a great podcast, you're pretending you're making a great podcast. So you're doing it. And so like, that's the thing is sleep is the same thing. We're all practicing it, pretending we're asleep until we are asleep. Um, but like, I've always been a side sleeper, but it, you know, for a while it caused problems with my shoulders, but partly and mostly that was a lot because I wasn't training my shoulders well. I was doing a lot of bench press and not a lot of rotation work, not a lot of opening up long range connective tissue for the fascia along that anterior chain. Um, so it probably was just being exacerbated while I slept. And the other part is, you know, you, you, I, I don't know how this would have happened in ancestral time, uh, but sleeping on your stomach is horrible because your head is either turned 90 degrees right or left. And that's not ideal. Um, so on your back, you end up snoring, and opening your mouth up and you, you know, that creates a problem there on your stomach. You're turning your head 90 degrees the side is a very natural way, but you just got to, you know, there's a benefit of finding a, you know, supporting your knees, supporting your head. I hate that answer because I'm like, well, what would people have done, you know, when they were sleeping on the ground and rocks and tents, but you know, this, this, that's as far as I've learned for now. Um, yeah. So I'm a yeah. side sleeper. It's fine, but you gotta have healthy shoulders. Yeah. I, I think when I first started trying it, it was killing my shoulders. And now that I've been doing more ATG stuff, it's, I can handle it just fine. But 
it's real it's really interesting thing about that because i know there's all these floor sleepers now that are uh liver king is suggesting everybody go sleep on some cheeky mats or whatever sleep on the floor yeah. um which i mean i guess theoretically it does make sense that you know where would we have been sleeping maybe the grass or like uh i don't know hanging in a tree or i don't, I don't know where we would have been sleeping as uh our ancestors but yeah definitely not on like a one foot cushion mattress i guess it's yeah and that's what i think about is like there's a trade-off with all these things there's a trade-off so you think about this like this goes back to the idea of the free will is like any free will is a combination a, it's heading into discomfort and so like okay you know humans are always looking towards comfort and so you know i'm a big proponent of improving the quality of your shoes and getting to a more minimalist thing but you know, the, the number one paradigm or number one uh, heuristic people use to choose their shoes is, is it comfortable? And it's like, well, that doesn't really matter. Is it functional? But, you know, it's a hard sell to get people to think that way until you get to point out that, hey, you got pains, you got problems, all these things that's going on. So, like, um, it's tough because I saw him talk about that and it's like, it makes sense. And maybe, you know, but I, I, I'm not sold on it yet because I don't quite know the benefits of it. And it's like, I don't know. I like the, I like the flexibility. You would think metabolically adaptable to eat whatever is available to you. Uh, physically adaptable to be able to train and exist. If you have to fast, if you have to stay up, you have to go to like you physically adaptable, but it's like, you know, it's tough because it's like sleep is, I, I don't have an answer for that, but I do see that. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, and it does fit with the, let's say the paradigm of what else I would think of in terms of like finding an ideal health. But at the same time, it's like, I don't quite know the, let's say the um the cost benefit analysis of that mm -hmm. i just know that it, you know it's like it's a hard sell if i ever find some woman who wants to put up with me it's like you know hey by the way we're sleeping on a two-inch pad <laughs> it's like okay i guess so but i get it it makes sense i just i just don't that that part is something i'm still continuing to think about it might be worth trying but i guess know, it we'll would be out. the, the trade-off like you're saying like how bad what damage is the mattress doing yeah um, probably not that much but I guess there's probably other health things we can yeah we can focus on like um, and the same thing he uses like Faraday you know like puts his Faraday bag for his phone as an iPad it's like you know like uh, I, I as a social media influencer now I live with this this thing on me all the time and I try to be mindful like as one thing I'm trying to do, like when I wake up in the morning that not looking at my phone for the first hour like you know keeping just being mindful but it's like the the, the um. Ben Greenfield is the, is another one of those buyer hacker guy, biohacker guys, but he wears, he goes on long airplanes. He wears one of those like suits that blocks the radiation. I'm like, <sighs> I mean, I get it, I guess, but some of this, I wonder what like the, that Pareto's law distribution is that 80% of the results come from 20% of the work. Cause like if you eat real food, drink real water, sleep enough, get quality sleep, move every day, breathe correctly and get sunlight that's probably good. I mean, maybe the rest of it is there, but at the same time, you know, once your body, I think, I think of it in the sense of like, once your body gets used to a certain level of exposure to stuff, like we get adaptable to it. So if you're eating junk food all the time, the next junk meal is going to affect you a lot less than me eating, or not me, but someone that eats like a clean me, but like, I don't want to be like that guy, but um <laughs> I would say you get person A eats only clean, all like only real food all the time and is very particular and is specific what they eat. Person B just eats whatever's there, lots of Pop Tarts and Wendy's. Yeah. And so that next meal, if they both eat the same meal, you know, that next Pop Tart and Wendy's meal is going to affect that person B much less than person A. They may feel sick and nauseous. So it's like once you're around this stuff, our bodies get pretty good at filtering it out. That being said, so like that, my point is okay, maybe you have to go through a whole bunch of like, get rid of your phones, get rid of, you know, the radiation, never go around well, 5G or whatever. I don't know whatever people say anymore. Like you sleep on a wood block and it's like, maybe, but what's the benefit now? Are you going to live five more years? I mean, the thing though, is that I, I really hate that kind of nihilistic view because I do see my parents are both aging very poorly. And my mom's got what's well, very clearly early onset um, sometime early onset min memory problem alzheimer's something like that my dad's got parkinson's early onset so like they're in the early 60s and they are not aging well and so that's terrifying to watch but at the same time it's like okay so that's there you know so in the same way you look at like uh just the amount of uh, 
plastics and pollutants and air pl- like things that are in the water and things that are in the in our uh, just soil and everything like that. It's like it gets overwhelming when you start to think about this stuff. Like overwhelming all the time. Are you cooking with an on-stick pan? Are you using you know? It's like are you heating olive oil up too much? It's like ah, I just at some point you have to like I just don't know what it looks like. But without going fully all in on that stuff, it's like. You know, they should be in the world, but you're going to die at some point. So I, I don't know what the answer is, but no, I don't know if there is an answer, but I, I like that you're talking about it in that way, because I felt that before, too. Like, yeah, like, like you can almost overdo it. Like to me, putting on a suit to get on a plane seems a little bit much. And it might even like we talk about how like cortisol is so detrimental mm. for our health. So like yep. if you're stressing about emf because your phone's in your pocket maybe you're just like causing more damage because you're stressing yeah Yeah. and that's that's what i think about and that's the idea of like this chronic stress has the same impacts of what a tb a traumatic brain injury does like you can give yourself dimension by being stressed all the time i have this kind of weird riff this idea that that you know, the, the physiology so our physical expression and physical capacity will be you know our health or our disease is an expression of our inner psychology so Someone that's got, you know, this paranoid all the time and worried and anxious and like never trust anybody ends up with some type of dementia. Like they can't trust anything. Or someone that's like beating themselves up all the time or really hard on themselves, really negative, ends up with some type of like Parkinson's or like where their body starts to fall apart. And it's like, I, I do see like someone that like is punishing themselves all the time and, and like they physically doing things from a point of like trying to stressing all the time, then it turns into a cancer where their body starts to like they can't, you know, their body like there's i don't have it all worked out but i do have this idea like you look at old people or the sick the illnesses that people get like it's kind of like you look at someone's dog we'll go back to dogs you look at someone's dog and you see their own i'm like oh that makes sense and it's like you look a lot like your dog but like you look at someone's disease and you go if you know them like oh okay that makes sense and this is not saying that people all like you know a kid that gets cancer deserves it because like there's obviously shit that happens but it's there is enough of a correlation that it sometimes is just interesting to riff on and think about. It's like, huh, I wonder if, uh, hmm, it'd be interesting. And so, but the point of that is to think, okay, maybe there is a lot, like exactly what you said, the way we internalize and think about our, our existence makes a big difference on how we orient ourselves in the world. And I think that's something that is mm-hmm. undervalued, especially in this marketplace of health and well being and trying to convince healthy people that they're sick. Like I said, there's no money in healthy people and dead people. So they got to convince the healthy people that they're sick. Well, one of the things like I've caught on from you and I've been trying to like, I don't know when I noticed it, but what some of the first Zoom calls us that you were on is like, you're just like always smiling and you're making jokes out of like everything, you know, you're just like, you're talking to Keegan and you're just like making fun of his accent or whatever you're doing. So like, I don't know, how, how do you use humor and how, how has that helped you? Like, you really are a funny dude. So, um, I mean, this podcast has been more in the, like, informative, serious side, but you definitely have that other side to you. And that has a lot to do with what you're talking about here with stress and, like, just not taking your life so damn serious. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the real answer is that it's a form of self-deflection that I use to buy myself time to answer things and get people to smile so that they think of positive of me and then I can manipulate them in some way. But um, in general, <laughs> it is there's a little bit of deflection to it. Like I, like it's wait, it's wait, a part wait, of learning. Self. Can we go back to that one? What you just said? <laughs> what do you? I want people to like me. Therefore, if I get you to smile and if I know how to, if I know how to either be self-deprecating or some level of humorous, then you'll think positive, positively of me. And then it allows me to, mm. you know, it's beneficial. So that's one thing, but it also. That's a good uh, example. Cause you just um, got me to smile and laugh. Yeah. And now you like me more. It's just perfect. Um, so like, if I, I can be honest, that. there's a certain, there is a certain level of like, uh, it's not, not like a nihilistic thing, but just a, uh, you know, laughing at yourself. Like if you can't take yourself, if you take yourself too seriously, you're going to end up, uh, you know, like you're just, you're not fun to be around. It's, it's just enjoying things of like, I would rather, I want to create an opportunity where people, and partly as being a coach is my giant hire as a influencer, quote unquote now, or like a coach for years, my entire job is getting you to like me. And that's all sales is, you know, I want you to trust me, know me, like me, and trust me. Like that's all it is. So there's a certain personality that's kind of like the, the uh like you know the, the 
quintessential good time. They're like, oh yeah, you know, it's fun to, I want people to like me. Therefore, if you can get people to smile and get them to laugh, then that works. Humor is a great way to do that. And a lot of times what's available to you is to be self-deprecating the show like, hey, I don't take myself too seriously. I'm fun. I'm di- it's a disarming thing. You get to, you disarm people when they can laugh and enjoy that. So there's a big part that's a learned part and it's a learned self. It also works to um, kind of like, it, it's a, ch- a, a phase change in terms of your mood. If I can get you to smile and laugh, then it improves this. And I like to be around people that are having fun. And so like, I want to have ideas. I love playing. I love playing, whether it's a conversation with words, like figuring out like, you know, like having a, a philosophical contact conversation on, on identity politics and figuring out different things. Like that's so much fun. It's just playing. It's enjoying things. And there's this great concept called uh, finite and infinite games. And so I didn't come up with it because they're not that smart, but it's this, this idea that like a finite game is a zero sum game. It's something that you win or you lose. So like when you go play a football game, there's, you know, it's a finite game. Did you win? Did you lose? And then people get their, you know, winner. They, they get, there's a, uh, they lose their job if they didn't win the Super Bowl, you know, mm-hmm. but there's something that is a bigger layer to this called the infinite games. And those are games that the point of the game is to continue to play the game such a way that there's another game. So you can think about it. It's like the finite game of a podcast host would be or a podcast episode would be to get on there and, you know, be right. You get on there, say the things that people want to hear and be right. Like I, I won the podcast, but you alienate people in that because it's a zero sum game. If I have to get on here and like, you know, whatever it is, is like, do the, do the thing that I, whatever, like somehow I go on and very dogmatic or specific and just rigid and obnoxious. Like, yeah, maybe I'm going, I won the game, right? People that don't take, the, take themselves too seriously. They go out there, you know, the, the, the other side of that is the infinite game of, I want, to be able to continue to play the game. So if you want to be able to come back and enjoy the next time, be on another guest or have people enjoy that and want to work with you, then the game is not to just tell someone that they're wrong. The game is to get them along to come with you to say, hey, let's keep doing this, right? So that's all sales and marketing. That's all uh, social media. It's not about getting out there and saying, you're wrong, I'm right. It's about, hey, you know, let's have fun together. And when you do that and people associate you with fun, it allows them to actually enjoy and associate you with that. And so Partly it's, I would call it the strategy, I guess I backed into, uh, but it, it works. And think about it, like I was playing volleyball yesterday and you've ever, I know I, everyone has had this explain when you play with someone that tries hard, they care and they're, they're really, you know, they're, they're cheating or cutting the rules. They're not calling things or they're being really strict with things. And it's just like, oh my gosh, like it, it's just a game. Like let's have fun. It's like people that try to cheat don't get that it's a game. There's a great uh, article I was reading, um, uh, I can't remember his name is Alex uh, is great. He's one of those brilliant guys is a really well thought person, but he's writing this article about uh, this uh, email about play. And he was saying that people that don't get there's play. And then there's like see, taking things seriously. People that take things seriously don't realize it's all a game. Then they cheat. People that cheat don't realize it's all a game. They take it too seriously. They get too competitive. They get too caught up in it. People that are playing realize it's all a game. And the real winning is getting you to come back and play again. So if I play a game of volleyball with you, I want you, I'll, I don't want to crush you. I don't want, if I'm a capitalist, I don't want to be the monopoly, right? The, having a monopoly is a zero sum game. Everyone goes to that thing. And that's what, you know, if you want to look at the role of government, it should be to prevent monopolies because free markets will optimize to that level. But that being said, there it's in the monopoly's best interest to not be a monopoly because it gets other people to play. And if there's competition, then it gets people to buy and spend money and grow. It's like, the point isn't the win. The point is to keep playing. And so humor for me is a really good way to relate to people, get them to relax, to disarm them, to, you know, get them to show more vulnerability, to play a game, play the next game with me. So if I have to think about why I do it, that's why, I guess. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> the, the infinite game idea, I like that idea too, that you're, it's not like this, it's not this numero. Is that the Simon Sinek thing? I think I've seen that. Yeah, somewhere. I think that it's one of them. Um, and it's Alex Danko, D A N C O. He's, if you want some great stuff, amazing okay. stuff, well thought out, Alex D A N C O. Um, and yeah, so I think it's uh, Finding Infinite Games is James P. Kars is the book. Uh, I think Simon Sinek has talked about that because all these brilliant speakers and thinkers, um, they take the idea and they kind of put it in their own words. Like everything I'm every, every verbatim, everything I'm, I'm saying, there may have been one partial iota of an independent thought, but everything I'm saying is just things that I've 
accumulated over years of reading and learning and listening and thinking and it's kind of like formulated into my own words which connects with some people but i'm not that smart i'm just you know observing things around me and just kind of putting forward and it just sounds interesting uh and then i think simon sinek wrote the uh the infinite game i'm looking this up on the computer i don't have this good of a memory cool uh, i can i can link it in uh yeah description I, of that being said i have not read these books i have just i am a podcast <laughs> fiend like i listen to five four or five hours of podcasts a day i listen like 2x speed but like you any conversation on this stuff is like you can get a ton of value from reading and doing this stuff and so the concept of a finite infinite game is valuable whether or not you read the book and get the specific use cases and all this stuff may be very valuable but you know that's that's the way i look at it so speaking of like people you learn from um we share come like some common mentors at this point now you've been involved with them longer than i have but um knees over toes guy keegan smith paul council um could you share some of the lessons that you've learned from these guys maybe break each one down a little bit and uh yeah what have you taken from them great uh, i mean that's that, like obviously you could write a book about each of these guys and somebody will at some point probably um so we'll talk with uh, with ben patrick's our uh, our lord and savior ben patrick the uh, the knees or toes guy he's, he's just he is a fascinating study on so many levels because he's just he is of all the people i've ever met he about is truly devoted to the art of perfection and, and mastery of anybody else and it takes you know if you look at like creativity creativity is only possible in the context of limiting yourself so constraint breeds creativity I mean, people think oh i want to create it i want to take off the bright like you know my my break my limiters and i want to be able to do and think and go wherever like you have to choose the constraints you want for your life and so you know ben patrick is the aptly named knees over toes guy there's a level that he has chosen to pursue this in the ex in pursuit of excellence and fixing knee problems really for an outlet of being able to dunk and play basketball but live a pain-free life but you know, with Ben Patrick, the big thing I always use, and I, I mean, there's so many analogies I draw for this, but the, the analogy of beating the drum. So whether you're a, you know, an athlete that's trying to train, whether you're a coach that's trying to work with people, whether you're someone that's trying to pursue mastery and excellence, we try to have a, have a um, whether you have a product or you're trying to develop something, it's about this beat the drum thing. And, you know, so Ben Patrick went from 100,000 followers, to 800,000 followers this year. And the thing that I always come back to is that like as creators, as people that are doing things and making, you know, making experiences for someone, and this could be as simple as someone that's a waitress or a waiter at a restaurant. It's never that other people get bored of what you're doing. I said, you get bored of what you're doing. And if you really want to reach and the, the level of w at which you can pull the flywheel is entirely correlated. The flywheel being a instrument that you pull and it resists you. And then as you, pull more and more and more it starts to go with you so at first is a resistance so you're pulling heavier you're pulling a lot more than the output you're getting is showing but then as it starts to get momentum go with you then you're pulling a lot the flywheel does it itself and it's got momentum working so if you can like so for right ben patrick has probably said this thing about knees for 10 years now or you know eight years whatever he's probably said it a hundred thousand times maybe ten thousand whatever it is but there is someone right now that's going to follow him that has never heard anything before. And the second he stops beating that drum and really pushing it out there and getting in front of people, then, you know, they're not going to get the opportunity to hear that. And so it, that's the thing is it, it's the, uh, it's a great book. Um, I think it's think and grow rich. Uh, it's, it's one of the Napoleon, not Napoleon dynamite, Napoleon uh, Hill <laughs> books where he talked about like, um, you know, it was three feet from gold and these people that, went out yeah. and they were strike doing it. And they basically, the point is that they, they stopped, they had one mind, they kept driving and they kept doing it. And they got, they gave up and they sold it and found out they were three feet from gold, but they just didn't continue to put the resources into it. And again, mm. not everything it's is like, a gold is mine. Is that like but, the dip, like the dip book yeah, you talked about? That's the, there's a great book by Seth Godin called the dip, which is talking about how, if you want to be the best in the world at something, if you want to grow and be, world class, then there is a process where there's the initial enthusiasm and you're getting better and doing something, but then there's the dip. And so the dip is this long middle where you are refining, perfecting, developing your voice. And eventually you're becoming, you're learning the lessons required to be the best in the world at something. And that world can be a small thing, but you know, it's still the best in the world, so to speak. But in some cases there's a cul-de-sac where there's not a potential to grow. It's not going to be something you can really achieve excellence in. It's just kind of like you're 
you're just doing it to do it. And so that's like, you can enjoy that, but just understand if you want something to be a great thing, like a podcast, a book, a program, a, a piece of art, you know, there's a long middle. So that dip is you just have to sit there. And so, you know, I was talking with Ben is like this idea of, uh, there's two things Ben. Ben, one of the things I really like about his paradigm is that he's very much one for removing boundaries. And so you look at the opposite of Ben Patrick might be Joel Seedman, who's this guy who's like all like gimmicky and he wants to like, don't go past 90 degrees. He's got a bunch of rules. And, you know, you can look at it as like anything that gets you away from rules and dogma. Obviously we need rules and constraints to be able to orient ourselves in the world or else we have chaos. But there's a certain level where you want those rules and, and constraints to be able to breed freedom and creativity within that, right? So, you know, that's always this thing of the liberal ideas of the democracy and, and uh, individual rights and freedom from things uh, or freedom of things. So it's like you have freedom of, of speech, freedom to do all these different things that are they're so valuable and cherished in a, a more Western democracy are directly juxtaposed against the, the idea that like the individual doesn't matter and that you're just a, you know, unit that is it crushed and so like there's there's no that there's like very communist or fascist ideals that you know may seem like different ends of the spectrum but really the the you it's a, the horse shaped the horseshoe theory that they're really the same thing so it's like this liberalism this idea of like freedom so I, you know ben patrick talks about the idea of like and this really resonated with me is your body is capable of amazing things and you don't need another surgery and a procedure and a pill and product to fix it like your body can do this stuff and it it's freedom from like you can go and, and explore and move and it's not there's no such thing as bad movements and restrictions it's just about what you're prepared for relative to something like Joel Seidman is like don't go past this don't do this use these. it's like a bunch of rules and so hmm. with Ben it's like the ability to trust and have a confidence in your body and to move forward and to really think about like removing rules but then really just beating the drum so like there's a life lesson and there's like a business lesson from that that I think of does that make sense yeah, so it's almost like Ben is making his own rules, but you said he makes the rules so that he can have the freedom, the creativity. So he's yeah. he holds himself to this like extreme standard of living that no one else would ever do. But well, it's way, funny because so two things is like now it's not that no one else has ever done. It's like for before we had TV, no one <laughs> watched TV, and before we had junk food, no one had cheat meals. So it's kind of like there's a certain level where. It, he's made decisions and choices for himself that are valuable in terms of how he feels he can best orient himself. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's important. But the, the thing I think is valuable about him is that he's able to create and orient himself with those constraints without productizing that and, and forcing that upon other people. Right. So like mm -hmm. that liberal values is I can choose and set my own constraints, the more fascist or communist values, you have to live and do this thing too. That's the difference too of like, you know, however you want to eat, it's like, I'm going to choose my constraints on what a healthy diet means for me. And obviously we can look and have some draw from science and, and let's say studies and, and you know, some level of knowledge base, we can do that. But when you start to get past that and you get to the dogmatic, religious, uh, you know, communist, fascist, whatever reward you catch or you want to call it, that's when you say, oh, I need you to do this too. So it's not enough for me to not eat animals. You can't eat it either. Or it's not enough for me to not eat plants. You can't eat them either. And that's when you... Mm. That's where you get words like bad and good. And there's really nothing bad or good. There are more or less appropriate things for you. There are things that may serve you better or worse, but bad and good, I think is a very entirely unuseful thing. Like you did a bad thing. You're a bad person. That's a bad food. This is bad for you. And so I try as much as possible to get rid of the words bad and good um, and replace them with a much more nuanced frame of reference for how they serve you, what's appropriate for you, what you enjoy, what finds value, you know? Does that come from Paul? Um, in many ways, yeah. So this is the thing is when you have true mentors in your life, there's the curse of knowledge. Once you know something, you can't remember what it's like to not know that thing. And so there is a certain level that the growth of your idea set, your thought forms, your capacity to learn and to express things is intertwined with the mentors you work with. And so your ideas truly become one. And that's that's what I look at as the modern day evolutionary marketplace of we are all like, we're all uniquely poised to receive certain thought forms and energies. And so the, our capacity as an individual to receive these things combined with our capacity to communicate them allows these ideas to expand at a rapid pace more so than ever before, which was what gives me hope for the future. It's like, we're continuing to evolve, but it's not on a physical level. That being said, Paul Council has been incredibly instrumental in helping me think about like, 
Paul counsels his biggest question everything in the sense of like, you know, just pausing to step back and reflect. He's a great example of someone that pursue or demonstrates free will in many ways. He tra- he think, thinks as much as possible. Like he's not afraid to say, mm, that's interesting. And then think about it and then process it. He's incredibly well, uh, well versed in the idea of like psychology and thinking about thinking. Um, I think that's meta thinking, meta thought. There's probably a word for that, but very careful with the language he uses. Um, I remember early on, we're on a call and I said, you know, like you could almost like the call, it causes it's more moral to charge someone more money because it, you know, it, it signals to them that it's an idea, like that it's it's a more clear value signal of whether or not this is right for them. And he was like, it's interesting you use the word moral. And so like, I've done so much growth in that period, a lot of that from spiral testing and looking at uh, value systems. But there is this idea that, you know, when you look at the language you use, it indicates the psychology going on underneath your the, the external facade of like how I what I say what I do what I say aren't the same thing but what you say is a lot about what you think and how you feel and more often than not it when you run out of values when you run out of words that's your true core values but your words lead and show and demonstrate your values to other people so hmm. I had a friend tonight that I was talking to and she's going through a tough time and so she uh you know she had this she made this comment of like oh my you know, my heart's surrounded by stone and I'm like interesting because I think what you're trying to say is my heart is made of stone. Like I don't have emotion. I don't feel anything anymore. But what you said is my heart is surrounded by stone, meaning I'm just putting the walls up. But it's one of those things where it's like, I like you couldn't like, she still has heart and love and energy to give, but it was, it's just an interesting thing of like what she's trying to say, what she said and what she tried to say are two different things. But one kind of, you can make the argument that there's no such thing as a Freudian slip because it's all our subconscious like expressing our internal value systems for us. So Paul Council has been incredibly instrumental for questioning everything and then uh, really being mindful of the language, the thought patterns, the words you use. So, you know, that's a really, really valuable thing that once you have that door opened up, then you realize that might as well be the simulation because you get to emote and think into existence, whatever it is. So he's been a phenomenal, he's one of those guys that will go forth and accumulate in a vast library of knowledge and then put it together in a more distilled way and it's an incredible resource he's just been he's been life-changing but it's hard to quantify the exact ways in which that's happened because yeah those ideas and thought forms have been so intertwined with my own um what are some of the other language patterns or like are there certain words that you've eliminated from your from your language that you don't think are are best suited for you well asked. Well asked. Um, I would say I was going to say that aren't right, but I, I try to catch yeah. myself. Um, so good and bad. I think I'd just be very mindful of the use case I'm positioning those with. Um, can't, should, it's the can't and should. I think there's one more I can't remember, but it was um, can't is this idea that you're speaking a lot. Like I cannot do it. Like unless you've literally tried everything and exhausted your resources that make it happen. You can't so, like, I think I replace can't with don't value it. Like I don't want it. I don't value it. I don't want it. It's not important to me. Should is I replace with could. So I should do this. Should implies that you are, there is something that you think you should do other than what you value. So I should do this. It's like, yeah, if you should do it, you would have done it. Right. I could do this. It makes it so like you should go here, you should do this. And so, which is interesting because what you'll notice is that a lot of the ways I speak personally, the nuanced language, and, I, I, and again, I'm new on this journey. So you give me five more years, maybe I'll be a savant, 10, 50, who knows. Um, but a lot of the words that you use that I try to be very mindful to not use are exactly the words you need to use for copywriting. So I was writing today about the running program. Running shouldn't hurt. You, you should do this. You get a very, this value systems and one of those is a very law and order rule of law, like right way of thinking uh, that it's like people want religious things. Like you should go to bed. You should eat, brush your teeth. You should not eat food. You should eat this. You can't do that. This is bad. This is good. Should, can't, bad, good. Like these are all very declaratory, you know, rigid structural ways of thinking and speaking. And that's what people want because everyone, and this is a Paul Council one, everyone has a secret desire to be led. Whether they let on to or not, they want someone to show up and, and take care of things and teach them how to do it and then, you know, make sure everything's good, which in many ways, I think, leads to a lot of the theology of God as people want to know that there's someone in control, that they're okay, that they're, everything's going to work out, even if they don't feel like 
You know, it's like you look at the way people talk about religion and it could be it could be their veganism. It could be the fact that oh, I was struggling so much and then I found plants and they saved me. I found uh, psychedelic medicine. I found Jesus. I found, uh, you know, a lot like whatever it is, it's like they use this as an outsource of like something else has got it. I'm OK. Like I it could be spiritual energy, whatever it is. And it's like not to say that any of those things are right or wrong or, or uh, true or not. I don't know. But. It's more of the fact that what is the role that this thing plays for you in your life? And a lot of that has to do with the fact that like people really want to outsource the responsibility. They want to be led. And that's a Paul Council. Everyone has a secret desire to be led. So a lot of people that get the first that they start to get humble, like, who am I to do this? Who am I to say this? And they reject this idea of leadership and being a person that can help things because they, they, especially the more intelligent you get, you see through this facade of like speaking in absolutes. I'm like, oh, mm. I, I like, I don't know, like, I don't know what the right thing to eat is, but it depends. And maybe, and I'm not sure those don't sell, you know, and you look at that's what Ben Patrick is great. You look at his, his nuanced well, the messages that really refer that really resonate with people are very direct, clear, authoritative messages with strong words that are definitive. But you look at the way he speaks, you know, when you talk to him, uh, unless it's something incredibly passionate about, like, the more you can tell someone's religion by what you do words they use. And I don't mean religion is like, if they're Christian, it may be that, but I mean more of like, if their religion, if they use good, bad, right, wrong, can't, should, like things like that, very declaratory words around things like um, identity, race, uh, gender, sexuality, um, religion, specific, like more like capital or like Catholicism, uh, Christianity, uh, Buddha, whatever it is, it's like, um, and it could be food. It could be whatever it is. When they start to use words, well, that's their religion. That's how they see the word, the world. The ability to say, I can step into this position of leadership. Because sometimes you got to tell kids, if you tell kids, should I cross the road? Well, it depends. Because sometimes if a car is going fast, you don't want to step into the road. But if the car is going the other direction, if the guy, like when a kid's two, you say, no, bad, right? And my dogs, I don't sit there and say, well, you know, when you do that and you put your paw on me, I can't do this because it teaches you the bad manners. Now, I say, no, off, bad, sit, come, stay. Now, that is, it's the language that you can use is directly proportionate to the vocabulary that the person receiving it has to understand. And if they don't have shared language, the dogs don't understand English. They understand a few words and the sound utterances I do, but, you know, like, that's there. So, when you're talking to people and you realize that they want to be led, you can step in and you can write things like my, if you read the sales copy, if you read the, the way that I'm very declarative and you can step in and like shed that and say, okay, I'm going to do this. But you also have to realize if I'm going to tell people this should work, this is good, good this is bad, I better be willing to back it up. And that's where you see this rejection of people that don't live in authenticity, which is why we all love Ben because he's like living the thing. He's you know, living, walking the walk. So there's this rejection of people that don't live in it because you're saying you, I trusted you to be a leader, whether or not I had an agreement or not. Like I listen to what you said. I listen to the declarative words you use, the should, the good, the, the good, bad, can't. And I, I oriented myself based off that. And yet you're not doing that. That's why we see so much hatred and vitriol towards our politicians and the people that are in power. You know, like a, the, the infamous Gavin Newsom who said, you know, wear your mask, don't go out to eat. And he's out to eat without a mask. It's like, all right, we can't stay in that because it's like, we're trusting them. And so, there's two parts is a lot of people, the more intelligent you get, the more you realize that there are no absolutes in life other than that absolute, right? You know, but never say never, except when you say never. It's like, I don't know of true absolutes in life. There might be, but I don't know of them. And the, the humility to say like, oh, what do I know? Like that's an intelligence, the mark of being able to hold gray space. Like that's the end. It's neither black or white. There's gray space in the middle. Now that part gets lost because when you look online and you're trying to help people and order them, the sign doesn't say slow down and bring your car to a stop eventually if you feel good about it and if it's the right space and if no one's coming left and right, it says stop. You know, the green light says go, stop, stay, left. You know, when we're in positions of creating order and structure, we need direct declarative information. If we don't have that, get chaos. So that's what you see this constant battle between like the progressive and the conservatives. The conservatives are trying to find order and like social reserve, preserve social capital and create like structure and order in which we can orient ourselves in the world. And the progressives are saying, yeah, but what about this person? They're going to say the yes, minimum SAT cutoff to get into college is a 1200. But what about the person at 1199? Aren't they valuable too? Of course they are, but you have to draw the line somewhere. And that means someone's going to get hurt. But that doesn't mean that we can't appreciate and do our best to love that person and mind and like, be there for them. 
the whole point of this is just saying you can tell so much about the language that people use and you know there are times that the truly evolved person so to speak is able to step in and out of different levels it's able to say yeah i don't know this probably work i might not know but it also is able to stand behind and have some conviction to say yeah that doesn't work and that's why you see people like the liver king he might not be perfectly accurate with everything but he's willing to get up there and say yeah i do this i'm living and walking the walk and this is right and this is wrong people love that ben patrick the more he's able to get and say yes this works people love that the more i'm able to get out there and really just, whatever hill you're willing to die on so for me it's barefoot running not barefoot like not heel striking if you're willing to die on that heel, the hill, heel, eh, um, <laughs> people will follow behind you. But you got to be able to walk the walk. And it, you understand it's a responsibility that you have when people trust you. And then you get people that do more like the physical therapy. Well, this study shows that this might work. And we need some more nuance with this. We might need some more studies and more evidence behind this. It's like people are like, what? Wait, what? Just tell me, does this work or not? So you start to notice that. And if you want to look at the world through those lenses, you start to see it. It's like, wow the whole like the matrix is up and you're like okay and you can tell what, what people care about what their values are you know you know what they who's trying to sell what their incentives are it's just it's an amazing thing but you just have to pay attention to it once you pay attention to it the world opens up for you it's pretty bizarre because i've been going back and watching old videos of you in this group that you're involved with and i think it was like maybe a, a year ago where you were asking paul uh what's the words that we use tell us about ourselves and now you're sitting here today like going off for 10 minutes so like yeah. that's the power of i don't i've only experienced it for four months five months of listening to paul but it's like i'm a totally different person and it i mean i, I didn't know you a year ago but it seems like you have evolved like mm -hmm. immensely over the i don't know how how long have you been learning in in the in the group well so th there's a few stages one of which is it, it's it's there are people that combine wisdom but none of them are your quote unquote jesus like paul council is a brilliant man he's an incredible person to be around but it's not like paul council it's they, they, like there's not like any one person has the secrets to life and that's part of it but it is so what, what i want you there's this idea that i love as my absolute favorite author she actually writes a sub stack it's a it's book bear express but her name is Ava. She was talking about this idea that she rails against is that wisdom and knowledge can't be found from anybody. Like wisdom and the more wise, the more knowledge someone has, the more value they have. But it's like, you can hear a kid say something random, like, oh, that's brilliant. Like, and you pick up something. So the point is to surround yourself with people who care, that have a desire to grow. If they don't have a desire for spiritual growth and spiritual growth means anything internal, like, like literally anything that steps... Spiritual growth is encapsulated by this desire to step into the discomfort and fear. The person, the more someone has a desire to do that, the more that they can shorten the delta, that difference of like proving they know they should do and something that they do. Like, I'm aware I should go and lose weight. I'm going to go do it. Like the more they can bring that down to a, like, a, a mm -hmm. you know, I know I should do this. I do it. Yeah. Those people are the ones you surround yourself with, which is the point of a mastermind. Cause partly it's Paul, partly it's being around by other group, other guys in a group, other people in it with all guys, but uh, other people in your life, but other guys specifically in this group that are interested in growing and then their ideas bounce off, they're an inspiration. It's the I, incessant, po incessant podcast, you know, learning, reading books, journaling, spending time to put it together. Like, you, you're not going to get it all. Like, I don't sit there and try to, like, I don't, there's some people read, I, I like to read books, but I would just much rather do the found time of listening to things and podcasts are really great. It's just like, if you want to learn something about a subject, put on 20 podcasts from different sources about the subject and just let the ideas sink in. And then they will, the important stuff sticks. All the stuff that I'm saying right now, I could not have written it down. I, I don't know what I'm saying. It's just flowing through you, but it comes from the subconscious underneath you. I'll listen to this and take some notes on this and see what I said. But it's just trusting that if you put yourself in this situation, a scenario, you surround yourself with like-minded individuals who have the same, if not greater desire for spiritual growth than you do, and you just stay consistent and get those reps in and the practice, that becomes a very powerful thing. Like it's been a year and a half since I got connected to Keegan. And then, you know, that's the very beginning of the journey of like, okay, I, mean, I, I felt this hunger for like, yeah, I want to grow. I want to change. I really want to do this. And I'd already been a podcast person, but really channeling that into like, I have these dreams, I have these things, I'm going to do it. And so, you know, it's been a year 
uh, a little over a year, a little over a year now, where I'm sitting by myself at dinner. When so, you know, I have friends and I do things from on occasion, and I'm hopefully gonna find some woman that'll put up with me one day. But you know, there's a certain level that like sitting by yourself or sitting not by yourself, but sitting and every night listening to Paul talk, watching all the AMC things, reading the reading books, listening to podcasts, just going and grooming and combing and. What people don't understand is they overestimate how much you can do in a week or a month and they underestimate how much you can do in a year or 10 years. And it's like, it's amazing how much your brain can explode, expand. And I'd be fascinated to have a conversation with myself a year ago. It's funny. I'll watch some of those things back again too. And I'm like, well, buddy, you know, my value systems has changed. You know, there's the way I orient and see myself in the world, the language I use, it's, it's all different. And which makes me very excited for five years from now when I'm, you know, who knows? We'll see the Ben Patrick graffiti. Maybe he'll be the Graham, Graham Tuttle of knees. If I get that big, we'll see, but we'll go. Keep going. So, yeah, let's, since you brought up Keegan, let's end it on, uh, cause the, I mean, we've been running, I don't have no idea what time it is, but I feel like this might be the longest one I've ever done. Um, I can talk, Ke- baby. I can talk. Uh, <laughs> Keegan is, he likes to use the self deprecating humor as well. Mm-hmm. And, and more than anyone I think I've ever, like he does it so well that he actually convinces you that he's not that important. Um, yeah. And the truth is that Keegan is really without Keegan, there's no knees over toes guy. Really, maybe there is, but but Ben he's Patrick not. will be doing amazing stuff on his own. He's got that drive. But keep asking your question. Yeah. No, I like he Ben had been doing some crazy stuff before he met Keegan, and um, and and Paul was doing crazy stuff, but there's. Keegan brought everybody together, right? Yeah. So he can, he really sneaks up on you and you, you act like he's not doing that much, but Keegan's doing some amazing things in the world. So yeah, what have you, I, I, if you, if you want to go off on Keegan, that would be a good place to. to close off here. I owe Keegan so much of a debt of gratitude. I still remember it was July 4th weekend of 2020, 2020, so like a year and a half ago. Like I had started to listen to Ben Patrick because I started, he popped up on my Instagram and he's like, oh, it's the knees over toes guy. I'm like, oh, look at this guy. And then I was like, started doing something I'm like, okay, maybe it works. And then, you know, he listened to a podcast with him because he, this is, so a year and a half ago, Ben Patrick, I start following him. He puts this thing up on a story saying, um, you know, I'm looking for coaches. I want to do Instagram live. We'll talk about anything. If you want to join or just, he was just giving young coaches a place to go. And I had like 2000 followers at that point. Um mm-hmm which I'll tell you the story of my Instagram progression is it's, uh, it's interesting, but um, the, so I'm, you know, following it. No one. So I get on and talk to Ben and it's like, I had a whole, I just been, I joined the program. I was doing stuff. I was, I was like, I'm going to learn. So I had like a whole list of questions and things. And it's funny. Cause I'm asking, I actually is on my podcast. So if you want to go back and listen to that conversation, I like strip the audio and put it on my podcast. So it's like, you know, when it was there, but I'm asking about shoes and feet then too. So like, it's funny. We'll get to the idea of like how programs come together, but um you know, so in the Keegan, I'm listening to all the podcasts I could find on Ben Patrick, everything he's got. And he goes, well, I learned from this guy, Keegan Smith. And I go, like, who's Keegan Smith? I'm like, this is a weird dude in Australia, juggling balls and doing handstands. And then I'm like, so I followed him and he's, you know, reached out and he said, oh, he's, he was doing his own, I don't know, his Instagram DMs or something. And so we ended up talking and I was like, I'm going to open up a gym. I got this idea. I want to do these things. And he's like, it's powerful. And I was like, all right, what do I sign up? And so I just signed up on the spot for real movement. And that was just one of the greatest things because it's like people get in these mastermind mentorship groups and they get overwhelmed. It's like, I just need to find the things that are valuable for me. I don't need to go. And, you know, I've slowly been working on juggling. I could do like five in a row now, but you know, it's like it's little things I'm doing, but I don't really care if I can do a handstand. Like I'm here to learn and grow as a business person and as a coach. And so, you know, Keegan turned into the next thing where he had elite money club, which was this idea of like, you want to grow and learn the systems of business and copywriting. And I've been studying all the stuff on my own, but it was just being in that group was huge. So the first one to sign up for that, and then it turned into the introduction with Paul, and then the first one to sign up for ATG for coaches, and the first one to sign up for Inner Circle. So it's like, this man has created the fertile soil that I have become who I am. Without Keegan Smith, there is no grand title either. Like, that's the thing. And mm-hmm. what Keegan Smith offers, and this is the most valuable thing, is that people overvalue what a CEO does, like a visionary does. They Like, you know, Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos and stuff, they have an idea to get there. But without... An incredible, I, I, it, it's, a, it's, it's a short seller called Keegan, a number two guy, because it just sounds less like it sounds like he's lesser than, but 
there is no like these great thinkers and ideas people can't hold multiple skills at the same time if they truly want to be world class at them and what keegan does is he accumulates the he's a visionary he sees ideas and he kind of pulls them together but he is like he's the reason that there's the ready to run program he's the reason that he's the guy who came out with barefoot sprinter like he's the guy that was encouraging me to think about like uh, hey the I have, I go out and kind of like accrue a bunch of ideas and work and do the sweat lever. And I kind of talk to them and it's like, he has these ideas and he puts them together. And it's like, ah, and the only reason is not more Ben Patrick's. And I hope to be on that list one day of people like that, you know, Keegan's helped is that people like he's the range of strength guy, Lucas Aaron. And it's like, Keegan is great. He sees things and he puts these objectively in the ideas and then people just don't act on it. They have the opportunity, but they don't keep beating the drum. They don't keep showing up. They don't really love it. They don't really want it. And, you know, Keegan's just one of those guys. He is a quintessentially curious guy. Um, you know, you can talk about some of the self-deprecating humor. I think for him is a lack of, let's say, you know, he doesn't have the desire, like maybe, maybe not the, um, uh, the there's, it's different personality things. So it's not like a, a detrimental thing, but that level of, um, I don't say confidence, uh, but that might be the best word. It's like he doesn't have that to be out and go out and be the guy. And maybe it's a level of he doesn't want to be the guy that who knows, but you know, he uses that self-deprecating human to kind of keep, he likes to stay right below the radar, but he yeah. is a quintessentially curious guy about how, what it takes to be more athletic, what it takes to be stronger, smarter, learn. He, he whether it's money, whether it's athleticism and fitness, whether it's health, whether it's business, He's trying to, he wants to learn. He wants to travel. He wants to see the world. He is big on experience, big on conversation, big on meeting people, big on relationships, big on ideas. And, you know, he's one that is an inspiration. My, the biggest inspiration I've got from him is the quickness to action. Like this guy will be talking about something. And then, you know, it's like, I think it'd be cool. And like two weeks later, like, yeah, I did this thing. And it's like, you know, but it's all, he's really good at like having ideas and he's good on acting on them. Whether or not he's the guy out there leading it, he doesn't always love to do that, but you know, it's a beautiful, powerful thing to be associated with him and to see that because he is, he's, he's an incredible guy. He's just, he's one that like behind all the big brands, there's a big brain and Keegan is that brain. As he says, uh, grass hasn't grown big, sure, busy streets. So, you know, guys that are smart, I can't think a lot, uh, myself included tend to have less hair. So, you know, we're working on it. So that's, that's Keegan for you. I mean, this guy is just phenomenal. He's, he's subtle. It doesn't, he's not overt, it's not in your face, but he is just, he's a special guy. There's a reason he's has been associated with as many big names and brands as he is. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you talk about the ideas because him coming up with these barefoot sprinter, like these kind of ideas, it's the same as him putting, you know, minds together and organizing these groups. Yeah. And all. it's, I guess you could say that's just, would you say that's like a type of, mind or he's just or you're just trying to like i don't know are you trying to define him in a way or yeah words literally fall short to describe any person and that's what i said yeah. the internet will try to squeeze you in to be a a thing a commodity a, a a you know an easy described meme but people are so much more complex than that they're they're they are legion you know it's i think walt Whitman said i am legion you know, I am large. I am legion. I am, I am large. Something like that. I forget the quote, but <laughs> you know, it's like Keegan's one of those guys that is just, he thrives. Keegan does not like absolutes. He thrives in the nuance and like being able to sit there and think about those spaces, the more comfortable you're able to step in the, into the absolute, the, uh, the better you get at copywriting, the better you get at marketing and sales, but you also, there is a lot, there's a trade-off, right? You know, it's like, if I want to tell people certain things, it's like, I give people, Oh, you did this, or this isn't right, or this is this thing. And I'm like, look, I made a 15 second TikTok. You think I'm going to get the entirety of this conversation in 15 seconds and keep it entertaining? Thank you very much. Please take your criticism elsewhere. <laughs> it's like, he, Keegan's great with that. He's really good at long form. He's great at conversations. The he Keegan's a great podcast guy. He's great, good at writing. He's good at like exploring ideas. Um, everyone's got different skill sets but he's one of those like he's an accumulator he like, puts together he just kind of sees things and fires off some ideas and then there's people that go act on it and are the buffoons out there that run around like me <laughs> i wouldn't call you a buffoon um <laughs> yeah so where... <laughs> I don't know what goes on <laughs> i'm a glo i mean if i do this I, I'm, I'm a glorified mon i'm a glorified monkey in many ways i just happen to uh be a little bit pale um not not as furry i should say i'm a little bit less furry 
so we'll you're see. um you're going viral on tiktok and instagram and um well now where, where do people find you and then since you just brought up the baldness thing i've heard you say that baldness might might be uh, avoidable if you're a young guy so how can oh, people well, <laughs> there so obviously different genetics lead to different predispositions but the number one cause of baldness is loss of blood flow which is also part of mouth breathing so ultimately all baldness happens when the hair follicles become damaged and they can no longer they get thinner and they can no longer reproduce and heal so all shedding is natural we shed all the time but the problem is when the hair follicle that holds hair in becomes damaged because it ultimately which is the true of all other parts of the body it loses it has too much tension placed on it and it doesn't have enough blood flow every joint in the body that's all injuries you're putting too much and so People never train their jaw. We don't train. We don't chew real food. We don't get any stimulus to that. Our teeth get weak. Our palates shrink. We breathe through our mouth. And so that continues to throw off our adenoids, our sinuses, change, uh, adjust things to our palate, narrows our palate to a V shape as opposed to a U shape. It includes, uh, it gets malocclusion, oral changes in pH, it, uh, throws off blood flow to your face and scalp. So those combinations of not eating, not chewing, not training your neck, not really moving and getting your face and then one side of looking down at your phone with constant stress, which adds to tension and the, you know, not getting enough nutrients and minerals, which causes bruxing, which is this, you know, clenching the jaw and grinding the teeth and having tight traps, which create, you know, tension and stiffness of the scalp muscles, not moving and expressing and using our face because we sit there and just look at a phone or a screen or phone all day. All these things create a situation where we're not getting blood flow to our head. So what you can do is manually start to work on massaging your scalp, getting blood flow, and then you know, in part and parcel, improving your nutrition. So you're actually getting healthy things to stimulate your thyroid. You're actually getting nutrient-dense food, so you're not, you know, you're not low on your vitamins and minerals. Um, like liver is great. Uh, cutting out the things that cause inflammation in your body that otherwise would, you know, uh, cause a degradation to your hair oil, to your skin oil, to your dexterity, your viscosity of everything. A viscosity might not be the right word for that, but um, elasticity is what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So all those things contribute. And so by improving the diet, getting rid of the stressful things, improving your sleep, water, movement, exercise, um, and mental health, et cetera, and getting blood flow, which you can do manually to your head. So massaging and pulling in your scalp, you can create a healthy scalp. And you'll notice that people with smaller heads and have, you know, people with a big round head tend to be balder. It's like, and I, this is not a true across the board, but you know, look at head shape. It makes a difference with that. But there's a lot of things. There's stress, there's blood flow. But ultimately, massaging, getting the muscles of the scalp to release, uh, getting blood flow there is good. And if you want the ultimate resource, um, perfect. The ultimate resource for hair is perfecthairhealth.com. I think his name is Rob. Uh, let's see, his name is Rob. But perfecthairhealth.com. Rob English. This guy I did this membership for a while. It is you will never find, you will never find a it, like in terms of membership sites. This is the best one I've ever seen. I mean, this guy has articles on everything, everything you could ever imagine, even possibly has anything to do with hair, skin. It's unbelievable. It's so well researched. It's incredible. So, if you're young and like it's best, you're like, oh, I'm not balding. It's like start before then. Start massaging your head. Stop. You start microneedling little things like that. You can figure out different things, but perfecthairhealth.com is phenomenal as a resource it's where i learned everything about this and you know sort of massage of course i'm not like perfect but it's definitely you know my, my hair loss has receded and ultimately you kind of settle with it i probably look better with a shaved head but you know i still work on it and shave and it makes a big difference because you know if i started five years earlier it made a huge difference so the earlier you start the better and you don't necessarily want to get started with rogaine and all this stuff because you kind of stay on it but you know, that's what I would say. Massage your head. <laughs> I love it. I, I, I did get to, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to ask because I was really curious and I really don't want to go bald anyway. So I guess it wouldn't really, I'd figure out a way to pull it off. But uh, <laughs> yeah, where could people find you? Um, so if you got my name, my main website where they can get in touch with like the programs and things I put together is gramtuttle.com. Um, apparently people used to like me on TikTok. I, I got to continue to make good stuff there. So we'll see. TikTok uh, is gramtuttle.cscs and then the same as Instagram. So they're both the same. YouTube, gramtuttle. I got a, I've got a podcast, which I do on occasion when I feel like something important needs to be done. 
articles, a newsletter, Instagram, TikTok. Um, and then, yeah, so I do a, a YouTube, I should say. So all those things are Graham Tuttle. You can find me and, uh, you know, my love child that I'm bringing into the world is my ready to run program. So if your feet, ankles and lower legs hurt and you want to run, that's the program for you. It will be the best best option out on the market. That is my 100% guarantee. I will live and breathe until that program is the best in the world. So working on it. Just said the 100, well, coming up on 100 people signing up for it in the second round. So excited. Should people do the program? People should do the program. I will not, like, <laughs> this is the thing is like, the outlaws are should and can. And yes, this is my, this is, you see, this is my like more religious worldview side. is like, I believe in this 100% because I believe in the capacity of the human body in your, the, like, this is something where you're really strong. The idea that you can, there is one note is that like, it's easy to hear this thing. Like, oh, I don't say good and bad and should and other stuff. So like to be completely disconnected from the world, a very Buddhist uh, stoic philosophy of like, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't judge things. I just exist. It's like, yeah, maybe it's my American sensibilities, but that fuck that. Like, I want to care about stuff. I everyone is religious. They all have a, a religious worldview. It just might not be wrapped up in one tiny little book. You know, it's 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 a fear or it's a faith. It's whatever these things are that allow you to grow and exist. Because if you don't care about things in life, you're not living. That being said, you know, it's understanding that like that religious side of you, so to speak, can pull you away from things that may might not serve you all the well all the time. So I will absolutely, that, that's the heal all die on, so to speak, you know, it's like, I, that, like, and it's well-researched as thought and it's, it's important, right? Maybe for some people it's getting fresh water. Maybe for some people it's uh, criminal justice. Maybe for some people it's you know, homelessness, whatever you want to call it, right? Like everyone's got that and pursue what that is for you, but realize that at no point in time is your ideal and worldview more important than the person in front of you. That's the big difference. It's like when people can't distinguish themselves from an idea, when you can't criticize me and make fun of me and I can't like, take it, or when you can't give a proposing point of view and I freak out, that's when it's, you know, you, you've lost the side of humanity. So, but that being said, you should do the program. I want you to do it. It's good. It's not only not bad. It is also good. It is right. It is moral. It is justice and you should do it. <laughs> and I think whoever's listening to this, you should also go read Graham's website because when I first read through it, I was cracking up the theme. It's so, oh, you, that is so funny. That is so, that's a legendary website. Um, this has been amazing. I don't even, what time is it? It's yeah. We've been going for two hours. This has been amazing. I oh, wow. never hit two hours. So you, you just broke my record. Um, never done that before either. So we'll see. And yeah, I just want to thank you. I, I, I do really have a lot of gratitude for you. Just it, we haven't even really spoke that much on live calls or anything, but just watching you from a distance, um, you're someone I, I aspire to be like, and especially in this community. So I can't express enough uh, how grateful I am. You're going to make me cry. I appreciate you. This has <laughs> been a uh, this has been more than I could have. And it's been great. You keep doing it. Keep beating the drum. I'm proud of you, man. You as well. All right, Graham. Go get some sleep, bro. I'm going to go eat. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. All right. Have a good one. All right, bye.